Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's microgrid webinar, jointly presented by Stanford Energy Club and the Bits of Watts Initiative. Stanford Energy Club is Stanford's largest student-led energy organization with more than 1,200 active members and more than 2,000 alumni. Bits of Watts is a Stanford University initiative bringing together multidisciplinary research teams to develop technology, business, and the policy innovation for the 21st century electrical power grid. And we have been through the last summer or summers, which painted a clear picture of how the increased intensity and the frequency of the heat waves and the fires can really push the California power grid to its limits. Been through the rolling blackout, the PSPS, if prediction holds true, this phenomena will continue and even worse. And we will have a new norm of this kind of things. So microgrid could present a promising opportunity and avenue to increase the resilience of a community in the state of California. Then people may have a question, what exactly are microgrids? And how can they play a role making the grid more resilient? What are the current technical, business, and the policy barriers of deploying microgrid in the state of California? Today, we have a very interesting and distinguished panel put together by Stanford Energy Club and the Bits and Watts. The panel will be moderated by two students, Lizzie Koller, second year master students in the sustainable design and the construction program, Olawashi Olalia. He is a finishing senior major in mechanical engineering. Without further ado, I'd like to hand this to Lizzie and Olu to start the panel. Thanks, Liang. All right, I'm going to share Thank my you. screen. Okay, let's get started. So thank you everyone for being here today for our panel discussion about microgrids. Uh, today, we're going to address the role of microgrids um, in adapting to the rapidly changing climate. And we'll also address the obstacles that affect the deployment of these microgrids. And first, I'd like to let my co-moderator introduce himself. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for today. Uh, as Liao has said, my name is Olu Ashei, uh, but most friends call me Olu. I'm a finishing senior, graduating in two weeks, um, major in mechanical engineering here at Stanford University. Uh, I have microgrid experience. My senior capstone was working with a rural village in Alaska and helping deploy an indoor farmer system connected to a microgrid. And I'm currently interning with our climate uh, at as the national policy intern uh, in our GC office. Great, and I'm Lizzie Kohler. I graduated from West Virginia University in 2015 with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. Um, I worked for a few years before coming to Stanford and one of my positions was as a project manager for a mini grid in Sierra Leone. Uh, so this summer, Olu and I were two of eight interns in the Bits and Watts summer internship program. And the two of us spent our time conducting research to better understand the current landscape of microgrids within the US. And we wanted to determine the key challenges in the widespread deployment of microgrids. So within our research, we defined a microgrid as a localized group of electricity sources and sinks that typically operated connected to and synchronous with the traditional grid, but can disconnect and maintain operation autonomously as physical or economic conditions dictate. And this disconnected mode is often referred to as island mode. So after performing literature review and surveying several industry experts, we summarized our findings of the main challenges across three categories, technology, policy, and economics. So the first technology barrier is the challenge of integrating various devices and technologies within a microgrid network. And the second technology barrier is successfully interfacing the microgrid with the main grid. And this is especially difficult when power consumers need the transition of grid power to microgrid power to be instantaneous. When it comes to policy barriers, net metering frameworks can impact the profit 
the profitability of microgrids if they wish to sell excess power back to the main grid. And then zoning, permitting, and compliance regulations are usually determined within local townships or municipalities. So it makes it difficult to copy and paste microgrid designs from one location to the next. Um, and then the last policy barrier is government funding. So funding for microgrid projects has historically been catered to R&D, but it's difficult to come by in the go-to-market phase. And then for economic barriers, uh, we identified capital costs. Uh, so microgrids have a very high upfront capital cost. Um, they also have um, increasing project costs if there's a long time horizon related to the lengthy permitting times, which was addressed in the uh, policy obstacles. And then there's uncertainty in revenue, especially when it comes to assigning a cost value to the resilience benefits that microgrids can provide. Um, and I will pass it over to Olu. Thank you so much, Lizzie, for that wonderful introduction. Well, today we are joined and have this team pleasure being joined by three guest panelists who will take a talk and tool talk and give a deeper dive about some of these obstacles Lizzie had mentioned. Our first speaker is Dr. Ching Tian. Dr. Chang has 15 years of, has 15 years of engineering experience uh, in energy and aerospace. He is currently over at the California Energy Commission, where he works with the energy systems currently uh, supervising energy projects dealing with smart grid, microgrid, grid Im implementation, and energy storage. Uh, Dr. Chen has his PhD in MD MS from Virginia Tech in aerospace engineering, a BES in mechanical engineering, and has authored three publications. Our second speaker for today is Dr. Nikki Avila. Dr. Nikki Avila is a lead expert innovation engineer over at PG&E. She currently works with the Microgrid Technology Group and is currently in charge of managing the Redwood Coast Airport Microgrid Project, which is the first, which is the first multi-customer uh, microgrid in PG&E's territory. This is very exciting. She has expertise and knowledge in climate policy in California. Um, she has her PhD in MS from Berkeley and a BS in petroleum engineering. And last but not least, our third speaker, Senior Director of Stanford Energy Operations, uh, Ron Gower. Uh, Ron started off his career in a nuclear engineer program with the US Navy. He then shifted into private sector uh, where he worked on combined uh, power plant, hydro, biomass, and solar. Uh, in 2008, he moved to California where he commissioned what, where he helped to commission and operate uh, the gateway generation for PG&E, a 60 megawatt microgrid, um, I'm sorry, a 60 megawatt combined cycle facility in Antioch, California. And finally, in 2014, he joined the Stanford Energy System Innovation Group, where he's currently at right now. He has many, he has won many distinct awards for his contributions to the field, and he has a BS in nuclear engineering. But before we start, we would first like to thank our wonderful guest for joining us today. We truly appreciate it. We would also like to thank Bits and Watts for their work in coordinating and helping deliver this viewer, this uh, event, which is being held today. And lastly, we would like to thank our wonderful viewers for joining and viewing in today. In terms of the agenda for today, our speakers, in the order as introduced, will give a presentation 10 to 15 minutes long. And after each presentation, one to two questions will be posed, engaging with the speaker. And from then on, we'll open to a larger Q&A with the audience. I'll be serving as the moderator, so please feel free to drop your questions and share through the chat. Uh, and please enjoy. Uh, Dr. Cheng. Can you hear me? Okay. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and this is Ching, and from the California Energy Commission. And thank you, uh, especially, um, you know, the organizer for the nice introduction. Um, for today's presentation, I will um, provide us an overview of our microgrid research program with a few highlights. I will talk about the SB 1339, uh, which is a uh, a senator bill about the microgrid 
and also upcoming research opportunities for microgrid technology. And there are a lot of uh, policies uh, which are related to energy and climate in California. For some of the policies, um, current technology might not be ready to meet the policy requirement. Um, for example, back in 2018, we launched SB100, which is about 100% zero carbon electricity by 2045. Clearly, we will need new technology to help us to reach to that point. At the CEC, our program is about through the research and development to help inform and implement these policies. So we work closely with uh, CPUC, car ISO utilities, and other stakeholders to address some of those challenges. And as uh, as uh, Liam mentioned earlier, you know, the, in the last several years, our electrical grid has experienced a lot of challenges from wildfires, which resulted in a great application of public safety power shutouts. Additionally, the extreme heat events result in rolling outages uh, for a few days uh, back in uh, August and September. Um, microgrids offer uh, uh, a new opportunity. Uh, it, ha it has uh, many potential benefits. Uh, it can be considered as one of the solution to address the great, great challenges we are experiencing right now. And they can help decarbonize our grid um, by using zero carbon uh, renewable energies uh, in daily operation, as well as provide backup power when it's needed. Zero carbon energy microgrids are a uh, opinion choice as an alternative to diesel backup generators. Uh, and also it offers energy savings and other benefits during normal operation. Our microgrid research program has uh, gone through uh, three different phases. Uh, we, started, uh, we started to invest in microgrids about 10 years ago. Uh, in the first several years, we looked into hardware and software and make sure we have the right uh, equipment and the controller for microgrid development. We also develop approaches to integrate uh, multiple DERs. We demonstrated uh, microgrid applications for critical facilities and the sites with high penetration of solar. We further refined uh, the microgrid controller. Our third phase is about business planning and uh, commercialization pathways for microgrids in California. Our, our uh, EPIC um, microgrid program has founded the largest collection of microgrids in the nation. The CEC has invested 140 million dollar grant um, to fund nearly 50 microgrids. They are distributed all over the California and within the three LU territories. This research program has demonstrated the resilience and uh, cost savings to customers and also helped address uh, technical challenges while informing policy development. Our microgrids have uh, three different ownerships, um, such as um, customer owned, uh, solar party owned, uh, utility owned. Uh, most of our microgrids use solar, and the overall generation capacity ranges from 30 kilowatt to more than 20 microwatt. So 30 kilowatt is a, um, a small scale microgrid for a fire station. The 20 microwatt is a more like a utility scale microgrid. Most of them use uh, uh, energy storage. Um, most of them use uh, lithium ion batteries. Some of those microgrid include uh, efficiency upgrade and including HVAC and LED lighting and retrofit. A few of them respond to car ISO and the utility demand response programs through load man management and uh, ancillary services. Our microgrid uh, projects include a diverse range of applications. Um, here is a, a portfolio of our 
uh, uh, microgrids that include a residential, commercial, industry, campus, courts, military base, and the community microgrids. These microgrids provide great lessons, uh, lessons learned and help to overcome great challenges. Uh, for example, and the microgrid at the Brigo Spring community um, uh, is, uh, is uh, actually a utility owned microgrid. And this community in the past uh, has experienced severe weather conditions which cause, uh, which, which cause uh, uh, losing power frequently throughout the year. Because of that, the utility uh, helped and uh, develop this microgrid to help the com community so we can keep the operation going without so many outages. Uh, after the commissioning of the microgrid, the resilience has been greatly improved for the community. And this is the microgrid and located at the, the Blue Lake Rancheria. Uh, it is a great example uh, to show a microgrid can provide reliability as well as many other benefits to the community. And during a PSPS event back in 2019, this microgrid uh, operated and provided uh, electricity to 10,000 local residents. And it enabled individuals to use necess necessary uh, medical equipment, and it has saved four lives. And this microgrid helped the tribe uh, reduce its en energy costs by 30%. Uh, another interesting project is the Redwood Coast uh, uh, Airport uh, microgrid. This is uh, this microgrid is jointly owned by PGE and uh, a community. A community choice aggregator um, with the increase uh, of uh, CCAs is going to be critical for the state to develop opportunities for both utilities and the CCAs. And Nikki from PGE will provide us a deep dive uh, for this project later on. And one thing I want to point out, you know, the, the, the knowledge gained from this research uh, microgrid has assisted the CPUC in developing the SP3039 um, uh, implementation plan. Speaking of uh, SP1339, um, it, it requires the CPUC and the CEC and the California ISO to take action to help transition of microgrid from an emerging technology to a successful commercial product. Um, so it can help California to meet uh, our future energy goals. And CPUC has established a proceeding to address the action required and also uh, established three tracks in the rulemaking. Um, back in June this year, CPUC completed track one. And CPUC asked utilities to streamline the interconnection process and maximize resilience by allowing and storage charging prior to PSPS event, and also removing the sizing limits uh, for energy storage and net metering tariff. And also um, utility, uh, it, it also asked the utility to create a dedicated uh, team to support local and the tribal uh, government uh, microgrid project. Um, even while making a lot of progress in uh, uh, microgrid technology, and there are still barriers, uh, especially when it comes to rapid deployment and also commercialization. So we need to develop uh, technologies with longer duration backup capabilities. And uh, what, I, what I mean uh, longer duration here is the days instead of hours. Um, currently, uh, microgrids are complex and each has its own unique design. This, this makes it difficult to deploy microgrids at a large scale. Uh, microgrids need to be designed in a simple and a modular manner, which will reduce the development cost associated with design, permitting, interconnection, and installation. We also, um, we also need to uh, find a better way to measure uh, resilience. By identifying the value of the resilience, we can better evaluate the cost, effective, uh, cost effectiveness of microgrid investment. Uh, yeah, this is my last slide and that concludes my presentation. And 
And the information below uh, is uh, my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any uh, questions. Uh, with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you so very much, Doctor. Uh, we mm -hmm. actually do have a couple questions. Um, our first question has to do with um, the slide, a decade of research, um, specifically in developing commercial pathways. Um, of the barriers, the three barriers listed, uh, the barrier, one of the barriers that sticks out the most is, um, I'm sorry, is the innovation. I'm sorry, so the question is in developing commercial pathways, what are some of the barriers which must be overcome and what could be done to shorten that six year time span? Uh, because that time span or that barrier is the longest compared to the three other barriers. Um, so what could be done to like shorten that six year time span and deliver it and turn in these into like something that outside of like demonstrator proof into something that are commercialized and in use? Yeah, um, uh, that is a very good question. Uh, I think, you know, in my opinion, there are a number of ways we can improve the, 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 uh, the, the timing, um, you know, for the, for the deployment. Uh, one thing I just mentioned, you know, uh, the modul modul modular design, you know, if we can uh, leverage some uh, pre-configured pre equipment, if we can make sure, you know, most of the work can be done in the factory and we can just plug and pl uh, plug in play so I think that will help a lot of, you know, the uh, uh, additional work and um, uh, that, that that has to be done at the site. Uh, another thing, you know, the, from our experience, um, and especially you know when we did our uh, demonstration for our critical facilities, and we had some challenges um, on permitting and the interconnection. It takes a long time to do so. So I think you know the, this has been brought to the uh, CPUC and uh, utility attention. So that's why we're working on streamlining the, the 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 interconnection process. So if I remember correctly, I think you know PUC come up with uh, some sort of like you know standard design with a single line diagram. So um, I'm hoping like that will help uh, uh, speed up the the interconnection process. And also I think we have some, some um, uh, policy and change you know. And, um, and also, when it comes to the interconnection, if you have a, 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 a microgrid uh, that's, uh, own, uh, that's owned and operated by the tribe or government, um, local government, I think Utility has a dedicated team to help them to walk through the process. So in some way, I think it will help improve the, the, the deployment uh, process also. So um, yeah, and there are a number of things I think we can we, we, we can we can improve. Thank you so very much. Uh, and last question, mm -hmm. um, Tong asks, um, could you please shed some light on how microgrids can enhance the resilience against natural disasters in current practice? Yes, of course. And um, so uh, I just provide an example, you know, um, from, uh, from the uh, from the uh, Blue Lake Rancheria uh, microgrid. That, was, that microgrid is a great example, you know, um, uh, for the PSPS event. So at that event, I think, you know, the, the basically disconnected from the, uh, the, the grid. And also, you know, the recently rolling outage and the, the, them being, you know, the when we reach to the, um, you know, um, if we don't have enough uh, supply of electricity, actually uh, during those days, um, the community uh, has been, uh, that, um, that, that microgrid has been and uh, island did like for uh, a few days during those time. Uh, another example, you know, I can give to you is, you know, the, um, uh, uh, we have microgrids for hospitals and the fire stations. Uh, I can use the, the fire stations as an example, you know, the, uh, with the microgrid, we are able to island the fire stations for, um, for about uh, 10 hours. So uh, as you might know, um, fire stations, they require um, diesel backup um, for the operation. So normally, they need to store the uh, the diesel fuel, and that that must last like for, if I remember correctly, 32 hours, three days. So with the microgrids, and uh, I think we can extend the 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 life of the the uh, the diesel backups, you know, uh, instead of three days, and we can extend them to um, uh, six days even more because you know we offset some of the fuel uh, 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 fuel consumption. Uh, another thing is you know the um, for the hospitals. I think you know the um, especially under the pandemic, you know we see um, 
uh, under certain conditions, and we want our uh, hospitals stay operational, uh, especially under those difficult conditions. Uh, you, even with the PSPS, I can, uh, you know, can make it sense even more difficult. So uh, our microgrid at the uh, Richmond Kaiser um, uh, uh, Hospital, uh, with that microgrid, we can help Ireland the um, uh, life safety branch. So in case we have uh, power outage or something, um, we can still, uh, you know, the the keep the hospital operational, and so folks can, you know, get if, if they need a treatment and they have a place to go. Um, so in, in that case, it can help the community also. Um, yeah, the challenge I say is, you know, the, um, the, the uh, I mentioned earlier the duration of the microgrid because a lot of those microgrids, you know, can last probably in three, uh, four hours to uh, ten hours. Um, but if you if you reach to uh, if for some reason you know if I, my, you, I look at the data you know you, especially for the fire station or not, especially for the welfare case it will take multiple days. So in that case, I think in that's why I felt like you know we need a longer duration of storage. And also, as you know, diesel um, is not in, in environmental friendly. So if we can find a way to re replace diesel with a clean. Um, clean and renewable energy, I think that will be very helpful to our environment also. Thank you so very much, Doctor. We appreciate it. Mm. Thanks. Um, for our second guest speaker, uh, we have Dr. Nikki. Thanks, so well, um Can everyone hear me okay? Oh, I'm so sorry to interrupt, uh, Dr. Shane. Could you please stop sharing your screen? Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Doctor. Um, um, am I sharing the right thing here? Let's see. Can everyone see my screen okay, the introduction slide? Okay, great. So um, I am Nikki Avila. Um, as Olu said, um, today I will be talking to you about the Redwood Coast Airport Microgrid. This is the first um, renewable energy microgrid um, in in California. That is, it, it's the first renewable energy community microgrid in California, and for sure, of course, in pg and territory. Um, I'll start by walking through different types of microgrids just to give everyone um, background and to understand what the different types of microgrids are and how they could impact um, resilience for the customer. So the first um, is the single customer. And the way I like to categorize microgrids is thinking about the level of participation of the utility and the microgrid working, uh, of the customer and the, micro, and the utility working together for the microgrid. So we have a single customer microgrid here, and this is actually the category of microgrids that are very prevalent. Um, when we talk about the Redwood Coast Airport microgrid being the first microgrid um, in California, we're talking about community, but there are a lot of behind the meter single customer microgrids that are very prevalent and they've been prevalent for decades actually. This is what the military and, and other like um, critical facilities like hospitals use. We like to define this as you know behind a single meter, so the, the utility does not have to get involved uh, once the, DR, the DERs are interconnected. And of course, you can consider this uh, the the drivers for this as customer resilience. If you have a critical facility, your uh, your an airport, your um, a hospital, you are a military base, you want um, extra resilience when the grid goes down. And this is one of our kind of our least complex microgrids. The second, which I'll be talking to about today, is a multi-customer microgrid. And this really requires um, the involvement of the utility because you have a bunch of customers on typically utility-owned uh, distribution lines. And because of that um, ownership of the, of the distribution system, the utility has to be a co-partner, as you heard from Chang's presentation. Typically, the motivation for this, especially in the past five years, has been increased community uh, desire for resilience. So communities get together either through their local government, through their CCA, the community choice aggregator, or they can even get through uh, through like a homeowners association. And they desire to have a greater resilience. And the question is, you know, how do we uh, install this 
this system to work together with the grid and also how do we um, allocate the costs and benefits of the system to the rest of the grid owners. The final one here that I will not really be talking about today is the utility driven microgrid. This is when the, the, the utility uh, decides where to deploy a microgrid. So if you think about the traditional planning uh, system of the, of the utility, where they decide when to have distribution grid upgrades, they decide how, when to build transmission lines, the utility could have a different cost uh, minimization uh, model where they figure out that actually a microgrid would be a better situation than uh, upgrading the existing system. Typically, these are where uh, the microgrid will have to be completely remote. If not, it wouldn't make sense for the utility to deploy it. And, you know, we're seeing an increased number of this, especially as wildfires are ravaging uh, kind of more remote and rural areas of California. So a little bit about my project, uh, it's a Redwood Coast Airport microgrid project. Um, it's located up in Humboldt. Humboldt is a rural isolated community at the end of the transmission line, which makes it um, prone to more grid outages. Um, it's very interesting. This project had uh, funding from the CC before uh, power, public, power, public safety power shutoffs, PSPS, was an actual thing. Um, but it's actually now the model for how we would try to reduce the impacts of power shutoffs. But if you really think about the initial motivation, I, I you know kudos to PG&E and the CC. Thinking ahead, almost four, uh, three to four years ago, about how microgrids could be important in the future, and, and they were exactly right. Uh, this um, microgrid is situated at the airport, and it is the it is really the critical point of, of resilience and exit in, in the case of uh, an extreme weather event like a tsunami, uh, wildfire, or in the event of an earthquake. What is unique about this microgrid is that it's actually uh, being proposed uh, by a community choice aggregator. So they're combining their goals of uh, local renewable energy. You know, CCAs have to procure local renewable energy for their customers. They're combining that with the ability to island and trying to build a microgrid. So in this state, in this case, you know, the utility and the community is coming together for increased resilience. One of the key objectives of my work is not only to build this microgrid at the airport, but to try to figure out how to scale and replicate this as Ching for uh, SB 1339. We want microgrids to be commer commercial, to be co to be at commercial level. They need to be able to go off off the shelf, maybe not um, as plug and play as some people would hope, but um, we need to not have such high soft cost in deploying microgrids. And really my main objective for me to feel like my job has been done well is if I can create standard, standards and replicable processes so that other, pe other people who are trying to deploy microgrids can do it quicker and faster and cheaper than uh, this project. So uh, this project is really unique, again, because of the established partnerships. You know, we have the utility working very closely with a community choice aggregator and also working very closely with the university at Humboldt State. We have, uh, as you see here on the right, the Sharks Energy Research Center. They are the prime engineer, owner's engineer for this project. They are doing a majority of the engineering design in, co in collaboration with my team. Uh, the funding that we got for this project is from the CEC, as Tim said. Um, the Redwood Coast Energy Authority is the CCA, and then we have um, these um, manufacturers like uh, SEL who are who will design and and uh, um, configure the microgrid controller. I'll speak a little bit more about what the DERs will be doing, and that's where we have TRC uh, working on the cybersecurity plans for the microgrid and the energy the energy authority. Um, that will be thinking about uh, market participation. So just a quick uh, preview of where this funding is coming from. I think this project got about $5 million from the California Energy Commission and also got a matching fund of $2 million on the pg e side from uh, the CPUC. So, you know, microgrids are expensive and this would not be possible without EPIC. So EPIC is a California statewide program that enables pg e to invest in novel emerging energy solutions to meet you know, our energy goals and to drive innovation around the industry. And we're currently on the third wave of, third and final wave of EPIC, and it's really fortunate that this project happens to be one of them. 
So here are a few technical details about the project. Like I said, it's the first 100% renewable energy microgrid. Uh, as Ching mentioned, diesel is not the preferred choice of California and being able to depend only on solar and batteries is what's unique about this project. It's sited in Humboldt, which you know, when I mentioned that we're building a, a microgrid in, in Humboldt, people look at me and it's like, isn't that where it's foggy all the time? Um, Yes, we're building a solar microgrid in a very foggy area, but the other benefits of choosing that location is that it's located at an airport and, and Coast Guard, and uh, I believe that this is the, the, the safest and most secure point of exit for about 200 miles of the coast. It's a relatively large microgrid. It has two megawatts of PV that is DC coupled, so they'll be sharing an inverter with a two megawatt and 8.8 .8 megawatt uh, battery. And the, this uh, resources will participate in the Kaiser wholesale market. So if you think about it, um, you know, we have pretty high reliability in the United States, pretty high reliability um, in California compared to the rest of the world. This microgrid will not be a microgrid for you know, it hasn't gone into operation yet, but I would say for 95% of its life, it'll be uh, connected to the grid. So trying to find co-benefits, co-value streams is uh, exactly why this DRs are participating in the wholesale market. Uh, it'll be serving 20 retail customers. Like I said, one of the key objectives of this project is to figure out how to do this again and again, cheaper and better. And so um, we kind of made things more complicated for ourselves. We need to figure out how to determine the cost and benefit allocation of energy services to all the customers during grid, grid connected and islanded mode. And uh, the, the, the microgrid had 19 unbundled customers. Unbundled means that they get their energy from a CCA and they get their grid services from, from the utility. But in order to make our lives harder for ourselves, we included a new customer, which is a bundled customer that is um, fully uh, bundled with pg &E. That way, whatever uh, cost allocation and tariff that we figure out is applicable to any future microgrid that could have any combination of unbundled and bundled customers. One thing that I thought was a uh, early decision for this product that I thought was very good and has now been repli replicated throughout a lot of the conversations at the CPUC and, and working on other projects such as the EcoBlock, if anyone's familiar with that, is trying to figure out um, what is the role of the utility, what is the role of the microgrid applicant. And um, as you see here, we've tried to locate electrically the devices in the microgrid in such a way that the utility is on one side and the kind of microgrid applicants, in this case, the CCA is on the other side. Um, this really allows for um, replicability. So some microgrid applicant can kind of come with their own design and interconnect to our system in kind of a clean break. And it allows really for us to have a clear understanding of operational responsibility. So um, let's, I have like two more slides and I want to um, maybe go through them quickly so that I leave time for questions. But uh, I think what's critical to explain here uh, is really how to build a microgrid. Uh, microgrids are this kind of um, esoteric thing that people don't really know how to design, you know, how, how does it operate? And that's really what we're trying to figure out here. I'm, I'm still in learning mode, even two years uh, into this project. So I, I like to think about microgrids in four distinct modes. Like I said, grid connected mode, where it's basically just DERs connected to the system. You don't, you don't actually know it's a microgrid. You don't know it has the ability to island. And then, of course, in the event of some outage or uh, some other uh, need to island, the microgrid goes uh, disconnects from the broader grid and goes to uh, and energizes the the distribution system. But it does are not the two the only two modes to consider. You also have to consider the transitions between those two modes, and that's actually where a lot of the electrical protection and safety challenges occur. So if you think about these six um, uh, work streams, this is how we have organized this project. The first is interconnection and service planning. So if you think about uh, how DERs are currently interconnected to the system, we, we stick to that. We try not to replicate anything that's already um, existing in tariffs and in processes of pg &E and in the CPUC. Then we go into pretty uh, uh, detailed circuit and protection design because, you know, as the system has to island, these are novel processes that most utilities have not worked on before. So we have very clear um, design metrics on how to protect the system. 
Thirdly, as you see in the yellow, why I think is super important is operations integration. So because it's a multi-customer microgrid, we're going to typically we island in when there's something wrong with the grid. It's going to either be a, a natural disaster. We want to have visibility and control of that microgrid to make sure that it's safe and is able to energize the customers on the grid. The way we're doing that is by building really the state-of-the-art microgrid testing testbed at pg &E. So we're building a very high fidelity microgrid testbed. And when I say high fidelity, it means that we're, we're having the actual DERs that we will be installing on at the airport. We're going to test those DERs in our, in our lab, the, the physical hardware. Uh, so it's power hardware in the loop with a very high temporal uh, simulation to understand really what are the operational scenarios of the microgrid and to ensure that they're safe. And of course, for comms and cybersecurity, if, you're, if, you're, um, if your rest of your grid is down, you want to make sure that maybe your, your network system, your comms did not go down as well. And finally, like I already, already mentioned, microgrid tariffs are super important. That's what the SB1339 is, also, is talking about to make sure that we have a way to value resiliency and be able to allocate that cost um, um, to the microgrid applicants and the broader grid. So this is my concluding slide. Um, I think the Redwood Coast Airport microgrid really uh, presents a lot of innovation. There's technical innovation in the fact that it's the first renewable energy microgrid, in the fact that we're building a state-of-the-art test bed, but there's also really what is more important to me, I think, is a social innovation, the ability for communities to participate in their own planning, for, for uh, the utility to kind of open its doors and kind of have a more bottoms up planning approach and collaborative partnerships with the CCAs and other communities to participate in their own energy resilience. And this is not a theoretical project. You know, we're learning by doing. Uh, you know, there's a lot of papers on microgrids, but we wanted to actually figure out how to do this. And, and I think with every design, with every um, test that we're doing, we're learning, we're learning what, what not to do and, and, and you know, how to inform standard and policy through action. And so finally, um, all of the work that we've done in RCAM, uh, I should have talked a little bit about the timeline. We haven't even... Um, uh, built yet, we're going to start building next year. It has already informed the Community Microgrid Enablement Program, which is uh, being proposed as a CPUC as a program where communities can come to PGE and partner with us to build their own microgrids. So, with that, I'll conclude on, and um, available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Nikki. That was very informative. Um, our first question comes in. Um, regarding the Coast Guard microgrid, is the four-hour discharge time typical for a microgrid BESS? Four-hour discharge time? No, I think the size of the, of the battery is um, was chosen because it's going to participate in the wholesale market. So the, the size of the batteries are pretty oversized for the load, and it was mostly because of participating in the wholesale market. So there's, it's not really contingent on it being a microgrid. It's more contingent on the fact that they wanted to get revenues from Kaiso during gray sky mode, blue sky mode. Thank you, thank you. Our, our second question uh, is, how is your experience in electricity access strategy in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia influence your current work with microgrids today? That's a great question. Um, I think the way it influences my work is, you know, I'm really passionate about the dual learning. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of, in electricity access, there's a lot of learning from the global north, thinking about our own um, reliable systems here in, 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 in the United States and how that can translate to some countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. But I think that the, the opposite is also very true. Um, and we're now seeing that with wildfires, right? You know, no one could have imagined five, 10 years ago that they would have multiple days without power. But those are the realities that uh, countries in Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa are just so used to. So I think um, translating learnings across the two regions is, is very important to me. And, and rethinking the electricity grid, rethinking the participants of the electricity grid, rethinking how we plan, um, is really going to be critical if we're going to um, address the issues here, which are climate change, and the issues there, uh, which is uh, electricity access. And I think what you can 
draw across those two regions as the commonality is just equity. You know, who gets to bear the cost of climate change? Who gets to bear the cost of energy poverty? And trying to make sure that our innovation is really reaching everyone equally. Thank you. That is a great idea. You had mentioned the idea of equity. Uh, I think uh, someone who has been keeping track of like a lot of like new uh, introductory like policies uh, in Congress, uh, many such as the Environmental Justice Act for All, the Energy Resilience Communities. These are like bills that are really prioritized and focused in equity uh, for marginalized community. Uh, yes, thank you so much for that thoughts. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, and for our third speaker, last but not least is uh, Senior Director Ron. Hi, everybody. Um, Nick, if you, there we go. <clears throat> Let's see if I can. All right, hopefully, hopefully you can see my slides. Is that, is that my slide showing up there? Beautiful. Uh, okay, um, this, I'm Ron Gower, and uh, really I want to talk to you a little bit. Of, you know, everybody else has talked about microgrids and uh, larger communities. I just want to talk about really Stanford um, and where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. Uh, so just a little quick journey here. If you think about energy, uh, our, our system, Stanford system, is in fact a district energy system. And it comprises all forms of energy, everything from thermal, electrical, and uh, we've also had steam for many, many years. So from 1987 to 2015, we, su we survived on a cogen uh, that produced about 50 megawatts and provided all of the electricity, uh, except for during standby, uh, during, uh, during that period of time. However, you know, we relied on 95% gas and uh, it was a, a fairly inefficient system. And uh, furthermore, um, you know, the, the efficiency of putting steam throughout the entire campus, um, uh, it's about a 25 to 30% loss rate of energy uh, by transmitting that around campus. Uh, and then, uh, so that was the fact that the facility was coming to the end of life, uh, the fact that it was very unsustainable uh, and we wanted to, to really green up Stanford's campus and make a commitment to uh, reducing our greenhouse gases. That allowed us to think about what we call SESI, Stanford's uh, Energy Systems Innovation, uh, a large, um, large undertaking. So uh, we often talk about the greenhouse gas reduction. When we came online, it reduced uh, our, our greenhouse gases 68% uh, the day that we started. And, and that's a big thing, but um, there was also a lot of other efficiencies that were gathered. For instance, we went from providing about 25% steam loss rate for an entire campus at about 550,000 MMBTUs annually uh, down to a 4% loss rate on almost that entire same amount, about 520,000 MMBTUs. We still do have some steam that's used for sanitary purposes, but for the most part, we provide uh, hot, uh, heating thermal energy to the entire campus uh, through low temperature hot water. Uh, it was a big transition, but it really allowed us to levelize our energy demand through the use of thermal storage. And it's a key, it's a key component of us converting into a, a true microgrid that includes energy storage. Um, and just very quickly, I'll show you that uh, we have a long range uh, goal of uh, which will come to fruition here in about a year and a half by the spring of 2022, we'll have a second solar generating station online and Stanford's electricity will be 100% renewable through solar power. In addition to that, and this is kind of breaking news, we haven't announced it to everybody yet. So I'm telling you here first uh, is that we're also implementing a uh, 200 megawatt a uh, battery that's uh, rated at 50 megawatt hours. I'm sorry, 50 megawatt battery that's rated at 200 megawatt hours. So um, that'll be co-located with our uh, Sol Stanford solar generating station number two. Um, anyhow, how does that get us to the campus and a microgrid? Well, right now we have a state-of-the-art uh, 
chilled, you know, central energy facility that provides heating and cooling to the entire campus, including the hospitals that are level one trauma centers. And that's an important point that I'll, I'll rely on here in a second. But um, the, the some uh, questions I were asked, I was asked was uh, earlier, you know, about curtailments and I'll get to that in a second. But uh, what I wanna talk about is that we made that transition from steam to a, a combination of heating and cooling uh, which has some substantial overlap and allows us to do heat recovery and uh, supply 90, roughly 90% 90 of the campus's heating uh, through uh, heat recovery. So that's, that really is phenomenal uh, and allows us to use electricity to do that. And so um, we have gone from a reliance on gas to a reliance on electricity, a, a completely clean electrified system. Uh, we have still about 10% 10 to 15 percent uh, reliance on gas and that's part of our long-range goal is to eventually um, you know go that last 10 percent um something changed here hang on a second there we go so uh the thing is we built this state-of-the-art central energy facility and uh, uh, you know we can meet a lot of needs. And one of the things that I will say is that we're in the middle of expanding that facility um, as a result of the last summer, not summer of 2020, but summer of 2019, we had a chill water curtailment. And that curtailment was not because of a lack of uh, reliability on the part of the facility, but on the fact that heating loads throughout the campus had expanded. And we experienced some of our highest uh, heat storms on record. 2019 was a very hot year. Uh, I don't know if it was the hottest year, but it was pretty in the top three hottest years uh, on record. And so that has substantially increased our need to improve our chilled water capacity. And we're in the process right now of spending roughly $90 million expanding our chilled water plant uh, that will um, provide us a big number, about 800,000 ton hours of chilled water per day uh, for the entire campus. Um, so, but the greatest system in the world is useless if we don't have electricity because we've totally electrified it. So how do we do that? Well, we looked at just doing it with batteries, which would be, you know, a very clean process, but that's about one and a half billion dollars. It was unreasonably sized and just wouldn't really work for us. Uh, in addition, let me get back to that. We have a level one trauma center that's, uh, you know, we, we provide all the thermal energy to, and that requires us under OSHPA, which is the California um, building code for hospitals, essentially, uh, requires us to have 96 hours of uh, energy production for those facilities. So that, that along with, you know, I, I couldn't even put a number on the, on the research going on at Stanford uh, makes it very critical to ensure that we have heating, cooling, and electricity for those loads. So we've looked at uh, several technologies. We have not actually decided on what that technology will, will be yet. It's going to the board here uh, in the board meeting in December, but it, we project it'll be about $175 million, and we're going to put in a centralized emergency generator. And that really kicks off our process to go down the road of fully, uh, I don't know if it's a, a, a verb, but microgridding our, our energy system. Um, and uh, so it'll be a 64 megawatt facility uh, that'll handle the campus at a full load for the highest heat storm day, uh, plus some margin. Um, and uh, it'll also be a dispatchable resource if, if needed. We're, we're still having to decide on that, but essentially it should be a CAISO uh, wholesale market resource if it's, uh, if it's installed that way. Um, the real advantage here is that, um, let me go to the next slide, is that when we, we, have, we came with this really cool acronym, SEGDES, which is Centralized Emergency Generation with Distributed Electricity Storage. It's essentially uh, replacing 45 megawatts worth of emergency diesel generators we have around campus, something like 83 generators uh, and if you just do the math, uh, which we've done, on um, just refueling and maintaining all of those units, that's a lot of emissions on an annual basis. By uh, going to a centralized generator and distributing batteries 
throughout the entire campus, um, it does a lot of things for us. One, uh, it, uh, it gives us, it replaces those 80 emergency diesel generators with an inventory that we're allowed to then use for levelizing our demand and also providing a huge energy backup for the campus. Uh, probably, you know, right in the, once it's fully done about four hours and that four hours is an interesting number as Nikki mentioned earlier. So uh, it could be very useful for us. One of the things that we're, we're having to, to look at is how do we utilize DES for building level, quad level, when we say quad, that's a group of buildings, a feeder level. We have many uh, electric circuits that we feed uh, throughout the campus and then also what happens when the power, we have a pro, you know, public safety power shutdown or you know, some event, um, I don't know if, how many would remember, but in 2010, an airplane flew into the uh, uh, Cooley Landing uh, transmission line and took out Palo Alto and incidentally uh, uh, took out uh, Menlo Park and I think parts of River City. Fortunately for Stanford, we come off of the Jefferson line. We have both Jefferson and Cooley feeds, but what happens if those feeds are out? So the, the question is, how can I, uh, the question to me was, how can I ensure the energy resiliency of Stanford? Well, the one way we can do that is through battery storage distributed to every building, ensuring that as we move forward, we, we, we make a facility design that says every facility will be based on battery storage for its life safety uh, needs. And also, uh, you know, to meet uh, some margin of uh, beyond just life safety, but meeting the electrical needs for those facilities. Um, and the other is, is once it's, in, once it's done, uh, we'll be able to have a campus-wide uh, demand management of, of that energy. And it'll be centrally managed through our, con our uh, control station, uh, central control room back at the CEF. Uh, Long-term plan though, I, I will tell you that uh, that's a lot of money and uh, a lot of work. So just kind of quickly summarize, um, we used to buy all of our electricity from a third party. Uh, we converted into a uh, um, direct access, which allowed us to use pay pg e for the transmission lines and produce and generate our own electricity, as well as buy it from other customers as needed. Um, we invested, are in the process of investing greater than $1 billion in our campus energy systems uh, with the goals of lower cost, zero GHG, and uh, some significant water savings. Uh, that's something else we didn't really talk about, uh, but we've, uh, I could talk at great length about that. We've reduced our water consumption substantially. Uh, we have two solar plants, a battery facility coming online, and then we're continuously doing retrofits on our buildings uh, with the goal of a district energy uh, distributed storage system. There's a lot of things I could talk about. So uh, I'm just gonna stop there and it open up for questions. Thank you so very much, Ron. We appreciate that. Yes, there is a lot you can definitely talk to you about, especially with Stanford undertaking. Um, the one question we do have um, in terms of like project interface or specifically this project um, you're mentioning, uh, what are some like, uh, some like takeaways from like the project regarding like project interface implementation, uh, control logic uh, that can be shared and like help scale outside of Stanford, if that makes any sense. So I need to know a little bit more what you mean by project interface. Yeah, so. um, that's, that, was, that was the question that I'm assuming they meant as in like uh, wiring connections. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, okay, I'll, I'll just go with that. So. You know, we, we actually sat down and said, hey, maybe we could take those 83 emergency diesel generators we have and grid those together. Uh, and I would just say right up front, um, the idea of taking 80 small generators on a small grid and getting them to stay parallel is a very difficult task. Um, it's much easier to do on a larger rotating machine. And I see Ching nodding his head, so. Uh, but when you when you convert that to battery storage, it's it's actually quite easy from a control state. Um, I mean, it's it's SCADA uh, PLC based logic, and um, uh, 
you just have uh, distributed controls. It's essentially, if you know what a distributed control system is, it's essentially SCADA throughout, you know, 14 square miles. Um, and then we bring that back to our control room. I, I'm not sure if that answered the question because I'm, I'm not 100% sure what the question is. Oh, I'm pretty sure it does. <laughs> okay, good. Well, that was like the only question we have, but uh, I think now uh, it seems appropriate to like open up for uh, larger Q&A. Um, so I would like to first encourage our viewers, if you have any questions, please continue to drop them in the chat. Uh, but we do have uh, some questions we would love to propose. Um, our first question is, um, as a regulated institution, uh, PG&E, uh, risk management is a top priority. Um, how does PG&E work to strategically push that envelope in forming partnership, uh, utilizing hybrid models, and really just um, going and, yeah. And this could be for uh, any of our guest panelists. Um, I'll answer a bit about, um, I think, yeah, the question was about risk management. Yes. Um, I'm not I'm not a subject matter expert on that, but I'll just speak a little bit to kind of the work that I, I learned about from some meetings. Um, I think, the, you know, pg &E has um, some risk models that, you know, they try to figure out um, which infrastructure are, are, are at high risk, and then those um, those infrastructures are slated for uh, kind of immediate upgrade or immediate repair. And so how that links to microgrids then, um, microgrids are a new thing um, uh, for pg and &E. And so we're kind of a new product. So, you know, if you're a dis distribution planning engineer and you have your risk model and that model has identified some circuit or some system that needs to be upgraded, you have your typical conventional list of products to go, you know, a new transformer, a new bank, a new uh, 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 resizing of the wire. So what our team is trying to to push forward as pushing the envelope is to have a microgrid, either as a, a, a grid connected or a completely off grid microgrid as one of those products that a distribution engineer can say, okay, this is this is my least, least cost option. This is the cheapest way of solving this problem for my customers and to keep uh, to keep their cost effectiveness uh, uh, good. And this is this what I'm explaining now is already being done in Australia. Uh, the, you know they have a more distributed uh, grid there and they really have microgrids as a standard product that the planning engineers can take off the shelf and, and use to solve uh, any upgrade issues. Thank you for that. Oh, well, any other panelists, specifically Dr. King, would you like to add or? Uh, no, I, I agree with uh, uh, Nikki. Um, she did very well. <laughs> no addition for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question, um, I think, is for you, Ron. Um, it, it is posed, uh, what is the fuel for Stanford's new centralized backup generation? Sorry. Uh, we haven't actually decided on, uh, we have several proposals. Uh, on what that technology would be, but there's there's several options for it. One, of course, would be an obvious is natural gas. Uh, there's biofuel, um, and uh, you know there's diesel fuel, which we we likely would not do. So uh, we do have to have a 96 hour commitment to the to the uh, campus. Uh, it would likely be natural gas fueled, and uh, and then there will be you know a, a fuel backup. However, I want to point out that. Uh, generally, that leads into the next question, which is, isn't that increasing our greenhouse gases? And the answer is no, because understand it's an emergency resource. And if you compare that centralized emergency resource source to 83, 43 megawatts worth of diesel generators, emissions are much lower. Uh, the other is, um, uh, you know, just simply we can you can use biofuel if you wanted to um, for that commitment. Awesome. Thank you okay. very much. Yeah, that, that answers a lot. And if somebody um, else can come up with another fuel that's uh, even more sustainable, I'll, I'll, I'll consider it. <laughs> I haven't been able to run it on, on, on water yet, so we're not there. <laughs> that would be a Nobel Prize. <laughs> Although we did look at hydrogen. I'm being totally honest. We've looked at that, so. 
that is technically water. <laughs> um, for our next question, this is like um, more for me. Um, so a quick background, the Energy Resilience Community Act is a current uh, resolution and that is in Congress right now. And what this hope with the new incumbent administration, um, energy and climate policy will be a top priority. Um, the aim of this resolution is to like help uh, dedicate federal dollars to help create in and uh, help creating the use and the use and leverage of like different distributive energy resources, specifically microgrids, uh, with the expectation of like more dollars going to flood uh, the microgrid space. Um, this is for the panelists. In what ways or do you envision um, the current industry shifting in terms of like uh, what is provided to the end user? Uh, versus what type of like model and systems are like or framework are utilized versus net meter in front versus back of the end meter. So this is for this is an open question to any of our panelists. Because I do know Epic uh, is like, you know, at least from our research this summer, Epic uh, is a lead, is one of the very few who are leading in terms of like throughout the states of like microgrid research and uh, their assets. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, 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 I um, can you re reiterate the question a little bit, sorry. Yes, um, the question is with the expectation of like more federal dollars uh, expected to uh, basically be dedicated specifically to renewable energy assets, uh, specifically microgrids and other uh, DER resources. Uh, in what ways do you expect the energy field to like uh, to change? And like what dynamics uh, do we expect? Uh, changes in front or back of the end meter in? Uh, just whatever can like spark your interest. Yeah, so um, I, I'm not familiar with uh, um, the federal um, but uh, in, in California, we do have um, policies um, to help uh, with uh, uh, distributed uh, energy resources. For, for example, um, if I remember correctly, I think PUC um, this year, they uh, renewed the SG program and um, they put additional funds for uh, storage and especially, you know, for those areas are impacted by the the PSPS and also uh, low-income and disadvantaged communities. So, um, um, uh, you know, we 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 do have um, you know the, the the government funds for that. Um, but uh, one thing I I I also realized also you know because of the pa um, pandemic and uh, there might be uh, um, I, I, you know this, this is just my personal view. I think you know the availability for um uh, for for this kind of fund might might not be enough. Uh, and also, um, um, speaking of the the uh, how to, uh, and also you know, I, I'm not sure you know about this. You know, California probably has the most of the DERs in the na in the nation. So, um, how to integrate these resources? That's another challenge. Also, um, um, you know, speaking of the program, I think our epic program program will will be continue and support the the deployment and also the commercialization of the microgrid. And we hope, you know, that by, by, by creating good business models and also, um, uh, you know, the, um, um, you know, the uh, find a more robust way to do the cost of the benefit and show the value of the, uh, the, uh, the resilience. And we can brought a lot of interest from the uh, venture capitals. Uh, we already see a lot of interest from the, uh, uh, you know, the, the venture capitals, and we have, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, we have uh, uh, a few projects, and they've been working with uh, the venture capital and trying to come up with some sort of uh, a PPA uh, for the for the uh, for the business model. So um, yeah, I think you know we need to. Um, I need to. Uh, we need to work on multiple different fronts. You know the. Uh, created the big business model and also leverage government funding. And, and also another thing I want to really address is, you know, the, I mentioned the low income and dis disadvantaged community. Still, you know, the, the high, high upfront cost for the, for the microgrid is still a barrier and especially for those communities. So how can we, um, you know, build a program and to help this community? That's another 
uh, uh, focus area. And if I remember correctly, I think you know PUC is going to working on a microgrid program um, to to do some pilot projects on that uh, uh, area also. I hope I addressed your question. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you. Oh, we also have another question. Um, are there any microgrid codes and standard development discussions within technical communities, uh, such as IEEE 1547? If so, please provide some examples of how these may impact the design of microgrids of the future. And this is open to our panelists. Yeah, so I can I can talk a little bit. I know you know there were a few um, microgrid uh, uh, standards. If I remember correctly, it's a 2030.7 and 2030.8. Well, I don't remember exactly which one is which one, but uh, one of them is for the controller development, and another one is for the uh, test uh, standard. So um, we have been in incorporate some of those standards in our projects, you know, especially for those ones. Um, uh, um, you know, I, I mentioned you know our third phase is trying to come up with some sort of like. A, um, business models uh, and, and standardization of the microgrid. And, you know, when we uh, after we issued the, the solicitation and the standard um, uh, was released, so we were able to incorporate some of uh, some of some of those standards uh, into our uh, solicitation. So we actually we are looking forward to see the outcome of it. Um, and it's uh, very unfortunate, you know, the um, standards actually is, is a, a little bit behind the the research. Because uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, our phase two, we looked into the microgrid controller, but at that time, and we don't even have a, a standard in place. So a lot of work is just, you know, the, um, uh, it's innovative, but uh, um, and also it's more site specific. That's why we are hoping like those kind of standards will help us to uh, build a more general um, uh, uh, microgrid controller for broad application. So another one I can talk about is you know 2030.5. It's more like some sort of a communication protocol, and also it lay out the the, the security requirement. So um, yeah, uh, we we have a few projects working on that and uh, trying to do some sort of like uh, you know testing and the demonstration, and um, for that purpose. Thank you so very much. Um, our next question uh, is dedicated to Nikki. Um, since you have brought up the idea of equity. Um, what are some of what are specific recommendations uh, that could be implemented on a rap rapidly replicating uh, many of these types of microgrids, specifically in low income communities? Yeah, I think I took a step at answering that in the, in the getting Q and A. Um, I think if you think about what made the Redwood Coast Airport microgrid feasible, it was funding a large amount of funding from uh, the commission. So basically opening up um, either increased funding or just increased awareness of existing funding and making sure that there are no barriers of access to those uh, funding opportunities. Um, I think also having strong government and I think some low income communities uh, that may not be uh, an advantage they have, but having strong local governments to advocate for the communities um, to have increased resilience one of the ways in which um, that would be helpful is through the Community Microgrid Enablement Program. pg e basically serves as, a con as consult consultants to communities uh, to kind of design their microgrid or even kind of answer the question, is, it a, is a microgrid needed? Uh, do they just want a battery? Uh, sometimes people don't actually know what, um, uh, I guess, hardware they need for the service that they require. So that kind of matching consultation, um, pg &E has opened its doors to kind of consult the communities. Um, but, you know, I, I work with grid alternatives. I'm, I'm very aware of kind of even, even these advantages that I'm listing out here may still not be easily accessible to low-income communities, so I'm not going to uh, discount that. But I think these are some of the ways in which, uh, you know, the high cost of uh, the microgrid hardware and the design engineering expertise, uh, just increasing access of that to communities could be a big help. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah I, I definitely um, agree. This is Shane, uh, uh, you, you, if if I if I may and I want uh, uh, you know uh, inject a little bit you know the 
our EPIC program, actually, we have special um, uh, um, policy um, 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 uh, for the for the low income and disadvantaged community. Also, you know, whenever um, we have a project, we have a proposal. Uh, if the site is located the the the, the low, uh, in the in the low income and disadvantaged community, we give a certain um, bonus point for those uh, projects. Also. Um, uh, I think our 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 funding. I think you know. I I don't remember exactly what was the percentage. I think probably 30 percent of the funding is goes to maybe even more um, goes to the the low income and disadvantaged community. So yeah, um, which is, uh, uh, help. Yeah. And an example of that is EcoBlock. I just wanted to say, Chin, the that's funded uh, like you said by by the your grant and that's done in a low income community. EcoBlock Microgrid Project. Um, our next question um, is dedicated to um, you, Dr. Shing, but I'm also curious uh, what Nikki and especially Ron, uh, what you have to say. Um, the question is, um, what are some different strategies that have been, been proposed uh, to better evaluate the value of resilience? Um, I yeah, guess it's, I can... It's a, yeah. it's a, go ahead, Ron. I'll go, go after ahead. you. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Tim. No, go ahead, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I was just going to say there's a paper. No, you. You go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just going to say there's a white paper about this, I think, by Schneider Electric. So that would be a really good place to start. Um, but I think the value of resiliency, um, and also I think LBL has some papers on, you know, value of loss load. Uh, I think Shiner, Shiner, Shiner Electric is more about the value of microgrids. Uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab is more about the value of less load. If you combine those two, I think those are kind of helpful starting points. But um, I think there's, you know, there's something to be said about the the equalizing nature of the grid. Um, there are different levels of load, the different values of load. Even just thinking about Ron's presentation about, you know, the value of resiliency within Stanford's uh, uh, campus. He's talking about, you know, kind of life safety uh, uh, um, values, which is not the same as, you know, someone's laptop going off during during homework. So um, the grid is kind of that equalizer and the microgrid, microgrids don't have that um, attribute. So, I think uh, the one of the key things about the value of resiliency is the location. Um, even if you remove the islanding capability, uh, a lot of people have tried to think about what is the value of a DER in a specific location. Um, so I think location will be the biggest contributor to defining what that value of resilience is. And then um, once that's kind of been equalized or, or, or at least estimated, then you can start uh, adding on kind of the value of those DERs are uh, not, part not participating in activities that they would have ordered or otherwise been participating in, and rather than uh, providing energy to the island. Ron or Chen, thank you so very much, Nikki, for that. Uh, so uh, this is Shane. Um, yeah. Um, uh, it, it, you know, um, there was some study about the resilience, I think, you know, from um, uh, some, uh, you know, national labs and also, um, um, you, know, you know, some universities. Um, um, for, for, from our, uh, for my point, this is just my personal uh, point of view, I, find, I felt like, you know, the reason it's so challenging to do it because um, uh, I can give you a few examples, you know, the, uh, I mentioned the uh, the Blue Lake Rancheria uh, project, you know, uh, during the unending mode, and we were able to provide, you know, the the electricity for uh, medical equipment, and also for uh, for you know uh, we even you know sa saved a few people's lives. So how do you how do you measure that? That's 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 a question. And uh, and when we when we value the the the, the uh, I think it's what we and, you know when we do the uh, cost benefit analysis for uh, microgrids. It's it's easy to justify, you know, the equipment cost and the inter installation cost, those kind of things. The, the the most challenging part is the benefit. So we see a lot of, um, you know, speaking out, uh, you know, it's it, it's easy to quantify, you know, how much uh, load you have been shaped, and also how much uh, um, demand charge you you uh, you being reduced. 
And those are things are measurable, but uh, the, the resilience, I, I'm not quite sure. Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, FEMA has some sort of like uh, standards uh, for those, but uh, I haven't looked into the details. You know, I don't know how broadly it can be used because sometimes, you know, those kind of uh, thing can be very site specific and also, um, you know, um, that, that, that's what we really want to do, uh, to do for our uh, upcoming research work. So, you know, trying to come up with uh, some sort of a consistent way uh, to measure the resilience. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, that probably will be one of the, uh, our uh, research topic for the uh, following year. So, um, my answer to the value of resiliency, which I, I take that really to be the bigger question, is um you know as 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 Shane said it's it can be difficult to measure but i will say that one of the things that has driven us to where we're going with a centralized emergency generator and uh, distributed electricity storage is well as as Nikki pointed out life safety that's probably our biggest is we have a level 1 trauma center that um i don't know how you could put a value on having that not available the the second thing uh, is and I'll share with you. I don't. I don't want to get into the exact numbers, but when we have a chill water curtailment that lasts five days, um, you know, if the students can't have class, hey, we say, hey, go have fun, right? Except for right now during the pandemic, don't do that. Uh, but uh, the loss of research, you know, we have literally, and I and I'm I'm trying to understate this, billions of dollars in research going on. And if that's lost, what is the impact, not to just Stanford, but to the future of those inventions, those innovations? So, um, you know, I can tell you that in 2019, we had insurance claims and risk management claims uh, in the tens of millions of dollars. So uh, that really pushed us forward to saying, you know what, uh, a little investment is worthwhile. And uh, so, like I said, we're going to the board here in December to get approval to move forward on a very expensive project. But what is what is the impact of not doing that? So I can tell you what it will cost to do it. But I, I would say that, you know, not just these reasons, but also can somebody tell me how hot the climate's going to get? I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the, the question I was asked is how many chillers are we installing? I'm like all of them. Everything I can, uh, and that's just uh, you know it's finally come to a conclusion after doing a uh, 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 an extended survey and committee uh, advisory committee on campus with faculty and some really smart people, and we finally came to a conclusion that um, we're just we just don't know where the limit is, and so anything you can do to improve your resiliency, and that's from reducing load to adding resources uh, to me is is worthwhile. Thank you so very much. That is like food for thought, uh, defining productivity, resiliency, and like value. Uh, on that note, we would like to like end, but before we do, we would like to thank our esteemed guests and panelists for joining us today and dedicating an hour to like really dive it down to these topics. Uh, also our viewers, thank you so much for joining in. And I'll now pass it to Lizzie. Uh, for the remaining few words. Thank you so very much. Yes, thank you to everyone for joining. Uh, have a great rest of the evening. Hey, folks, before we jump off here, because a lot of people have asked and sent me, uh, somebody sent me an email about tours of the plant. And uh, I think uh, Wahila well, sent a, uh, put a link there. I just want to point out that right now, if you go to that link, you're going to get a big thing that says we're not doing tours right now. So until the pandemic is over, uh, our facilities are restricted. So, uh, but do do look at that link, and uh, we'll be happy to entertain that as soon as uh, as soon as we get past this COVID thing. So, have a good evening. Yes, thank you so very much. Uh, again, COVID has put a dent on our plans, but like climate and policy just keeps on going, right? <laughs> thank you also very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Have have a good one. Bye. Thank you. Bye.